Welcome to 2023's first Speakeasy Salon, brought to you by American Insight. American Insight's mission is to promote the history and values of free speech, human rights, and the rule of law by discussing how these values emerge in contemporary societies around the world through the lens of independent filmmakers. My name is Fei Yuan, and I'm a New York-based film producer, editor, and curator. A documentary I worked on called Jazz in China won American Insights 2022 Free Speech Award, and I'm honored to be here today to co-moderate this month's Speakeasy Salon in celebration of Women's History Month and International Women's Day, which is tomorrow. I'm thrilled to introduce my co-moderator, Bluma Hammerhead, a current freshman at Amherst College who is planning to study English and neuroscience. Bluma is passionate about free speech and women's rights around the world. And our special guest for this month's Speakeasy, Rahil Raza, is president of the Council for Muslims Facing Tomorrow, founding member of the Muslim Reform Movement, director of Forum for Learning, president of the steering committee of the Council for Muslims Against Anti-Semitism and National Advisory Board of Abraham Global Peace Initiative. She is an award-winning journalist, public speaker, advocate for human rights, gender equality, and dignity in diversity. Rahil is also the narrator and one of the on-screen participants in an award-winning documentary called Honor Diaries, which was the recipient of the 2015 Free Speech Award. Rahil, welcome. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. Thank Thanks, you, Luma. Faye. Thanks, Faye. Um, and thank you, Rahil. It's so exciting to be here and have the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I just want to start off talking a little bit about your background and your childhood. Could you tell us a little bit about your upbringing in Pakistan? Um, and how did your experience as a young person shape you into the activist and advocate for women's rights that you are today? Thank you, Bluma and Faye. It's uh, such an honor to be here with you lovely young people. So while um, growing up in Pakistan, uh, my father was in the army, both my mother and father were educated. I was passionate about reading, um, but there was something about the society, which was a patriarchal society. I mean, it's not, it wasn't patriarchal in a you know, violently negative way, it was just patriarchy. Uh, men ruled, <laughs> it, you know, and everyone accepted it. But there was a dichotomy in the, uh, in the society, which is that a very small percentage of Pakistanis are educated and elite, those who are fortunate. Uh, you know, three quarters of the country is tribal, um, illiterate, and uh, you know, and also economically deprived, and this is something that always bothered me. The inequity, inequities, the inequities between boys and girls, where uh, boys had far more privileges than girls had. Uh, the inequities uh, financially and socially, and the fact that those domestic helpers that came uh, to our homes from the tribal areas. Uh, their children never got had a chance to uh, read or study or be educated. And I always had, had these questions. I mean, I grew up in a culture where women were supposed to be seen and not heard. And I was constantly asking questions. Every time I left the house, my mother would say to me, don't ask too many questions. Don't talk too much. And I did exactly that. I was curious from a young age. I was rebellious. I did not want to accept the status quo. So when I saw that this was the nature of society, I tried to do whatever I could. I, I didn't even know the meaning of the word um, activist or advocate. I just did it. I used to take my school books and my pencils and you know, go into the areas where the tribal domestics lived and try and educate their kids and uh, help them study. In fact, I spent more time with them than I did in my own home. And so the inequities in the world always, always bothered me, but I never got definitive answers because the answer was always, this is the way it is. Right, yeah. And it was really wonderful to see you um, speak out um, in the movie, The Honor Diaries. And in that film, we saw a lot of conversation about honor and the definition of honor in societies like Pakistan. And I'm wondering if you could speak to how you personally define honor and what your personal experience or relationship with honor has been. 
you know, if you were to look up the meaning of the word honor in the dictionary, it's something very positive. You know, it talks about respect and high esteem. But the way, unfortunately, that honor has been used in these uh, societies, mostly tribal, has been, it's, it's a very different thing. So the meaning of honor for me has completely changed because I have seen what has happened. Um, I mean, if you were to look at UN statistics, uh, just the recorded statistics say that there have been almost uh, over a thousand honor killings in Pakistan every year. And these are just the reported ones. So it makes you think how the word honor is being used. Now in these um, uh, tribal societies, in, in these village communities, the honor of a family, of a village, of, of the entire uh, tribe is vested in the woman. What she does, what she wears, who she sees, and the word dishonor is more frequently used. So a girl or a young woman could very quickly dishonor the whole community by simply speaking on a cell phone, by looking at a boy, by asking to be educated, by wearing clothes that don't necessarily fit the norm. So this pressure on women and girls to uphold the honor of an entire a community, a village, a tribe is something that is very, very painful. And very often when that honor, so-called perceived honor is not, not upheld, lives are taken to, to keep the honor of that community. There have not been enough discussions in our communities about the meaning of the word honor as we are having now, which you know comes back to the idea of free speech these are words that are considered taboo. So very few people will address them because unless you talk about it, you can't address the problem. Thank you for that, yeah. And I think Honor Diaries really does start that conversation about the definition of honor. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how the film Honor Diaries came into being. Um, what were the beginnings of that? So the ideas behind it, the people who had the idea, the producer, director, the filmmaker, all come from diverse backgrounds. And being, being women, they knew that these issues existed. For example, Ayan Hirsi Ali, who has been at the lead of dealing uh, with, uh, with um, female genital mutilation, you know, she's originally from Somalia, plus some of the other people who were involved in this. But as I said, these were never issues that were brought to the table because they were considered taboo. So at, in 2013, uh, after a year of uh, you know, brainstorming, uh, they decided that this is something that definitely needs to be put out there. And the three major issues in Honor Diaries were female genital mutilation, uh, forced and underage marriage, and uh, honor-based killings. All of which, by the way, was not just happening in the tribes in Pakistan, they were now happening in the West. And there were statistics to show that these were taking place right here in North America. So they decided that this was something that they needed to do, but it's a delicate subject, it's a sensitive subject, it's a taboo subject, so how do they go about? So they started talking to people and that's how I got a phone call from one of the directors who I knew because I used to work for Clarion. And uh, you know, he said, we want to do this, what do you think? And my instant first major gut reaction was, it's something that needs to be done, but I will only do it if there's no script. If this is organic and not, I don't want to be told what to say because this has happened my whole life. If we have the freedom to say what we want, express ourselves, then I'm in. And they thought, agreed with that. And you know, so they started uh, uh, getting in touch with these other women who were all activists in their own way, dealing with different aspects of honor-based violence. And they brought us together in this beautiful home in New Jersey. And they just put us together for two days and let us talk. And it was beautiful. You know, it was so organic. We laughed together, we cried, we reached out to each other, we heard stories that we didn't think even existed. And it was very, very powerful. You know, this is the first film that has ever addressed these issues with the clarity that it has. Uh, 
going to unmute myself. <laughs> and actually yeah. on that notion of um, female solidarity, um, that was one aspect that really came out very strongly in this documentary. And it's also so interesting to hear um, how the participants, all nine on-camera participants, differentiate between Islam, the religion, and the honor-based culture, um, as you described, surrounding it, that is responsible for perpetuating the sort of cycle of gender-based violence. And this, I think, is in a very important difference that gets lost mm -hmm. when discussing Muslim culture. And so I'm curious, um, in the 10 years since this film came out, do you feel public dialogue or conversations now are more sensitive to this um, very important difference? Yes, definitely. Uh, the, the audience, uh, the public, the masses are more sensitive to this issue. And the reason is that on the side, we work on you know radicalization issues as well. And you have to understand that honor-based violence is actually the result of radicalization. You know, it's it's a form of terrorism, it's a form of radicalization. So in the work that I do in my organization, apart from honor diaries, is differentiate for the public the difference between Islam as a faith, as a spiritual journey, which I follow, and Islam as a political tool. And that is called Islamism. And that differentiation has definitely come forth. You know, what we see in Honor Diaries, which, by the way, is not concentrated only in Muslim societies. Uh, if you remember, there is a Sikh girl uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in the film. So honor-based violence takes place in all cultures and societies. It's unfortunate that it is higher in percentage in Muslim majority societies. And that is also because what I had first mentioned, because of the tribal cultures, because of the lack of education, because of the lack of outreach by the women and the lack of awareness. So yes, uh, the discussion was very helpful. Although I will say that there were people who tried to stop us. Uh, you know, there were acquisitions of Islamophobia, which is a term that is used very generally to stop any kind of conversation or discussion and debate. And so, you know, we were accused of being against Islam and uh, there were some screenings where, uh, you know, the students tried to stop the screenings again with these labels, but we just forged ahead because we knew, I mean, I was there in the film speaking as a practicing observant Muslim woman. So, you know, what Islamophobia, hello. Uh, but, you know, these are the tactics that are used to stop the conversation so that we don't bring these issues to the table. So some of the, the uh, feedback was hard. Some of the screenings were difficult. But overall, it was one of the most successful ventures in terms of women's rights uh, overall and specifically women's rights in Muslim majority society. Great. And actually, on the topic of these educational screenings and panels that you held, you know, after the film was released, I'm curious, um, were any of the film's participants actively engaged in the um, release process? Were they involved in the panels? And um, who else did you recruit for these um, panels? Because I agree, this is a film that you sort of need to watch and then it needs to be paired with a discussion afterwards. So you can get really, can you can do a deeper dive into the issues that come up. Yes, absolutely. We realized. So, so let me backtrack a second. So when I decided to participate in the film, um, I also became part of, uh, partly the narr narrator. And I worked with them as a consultant as well, because it was important to have a Muslim eye on it and a Muslim perspective so that we kept within the boundaries of what was accept acceptable. Already, we knew we were dealing with three very taboo topics, so we didn't want it uh, not to be uh, able to be screened in, in some Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and the participants all lived across North America. In fact, one of them came from Africa, uh, the Sudan Sudanese woman in it. And so, uh, and of course the UK. So each one of us participated in the film screenings whenever we could. It just so happened that I was retired at that time and I love travel. So I tended to be at more screenings than most of them, you know, who are women who have daytime jobs and families. So whenever someone was available, we had decided that this film is not a standalone film. It definitely needs a dialogue in order to understand the nuances and, you know, the kinds of questions that you are asking me, which come up 
continuously. So we made sure that there was always someone with a panel or, you know, a single person when we could get a panel. So, uh, you know, if wherever we were, if we could get a woman's rights activist, if we could get a Muslim activist, if we could get somebody who's, who's dealing with, uh, you know, violence against women, we would bring them in. Um, sometimes there were, there were people who had their own experience and, you know, what was amazing is some of the, the things that happened at one screening. Uh, I can't recall, it's been a while ago, where it, in, in, at a university in the United States, two young Sikh girls came up to us and they wept because they said their families were forcing them into marriage. And, you know, having seen this film, they felt that there was some solidarity and, you know, what could they do? Uh, we had a screening in, in Washington, D.C., where a young woman uh, who had uh, who had experienced female genital mutilation flew in from Atlanta and decided to become a spokesperson and a poster person for, for the film uh, because it was her personal experience. So we had the most amazing experiences where young women who had been through these experiences or were in fear of these experiences suddenly felt empowered to speak out. You know, they found solidarity and we put our hearts and hands out and said, yes, we will support you, we'll embrace you. Yeah, and I imagine that your audience also will most likely be people who already have an invested interest in the subject matter for example, the two Sikh women that you spoke of. Um, but what did you do also specifically during this process um, that would allow this film to reach an even wider audience? Maybe people who may not have prior knowledge or, or experience, but really need to see this film to become more aware of just the urgency of this. So the first five years of the making of Honor Diary, there was constantly the team in the back that was working on marketing and, you know, figuring out, you know, how do we want to do this? We want to get it on Netflix. We want to get it on television. We had screenings in theaters wherever we could. And then, of course, you know, everyone bought tickets. I think the biggest impact for me personally, and, you know, which I was involved in, I traveled across 100 universities in North America with the film. And at these universities, you had these young people, some of them very, very um, hostile to the idea. Uh, some of them quite scared. Some of them had no idea that this even existed. You know, they asked questions like, you, you, you know, come on, is this real? And we were able to tell the stories and say, yes, you, you are hearing from the voices of those who've experienced it, that it is real. So it was not only preaching to the choir. We were able to expand the level of the film and the awareness to larger communities who would have otherwise never have been able to talk about these issues. And it, so with the students, there was always a little introduction, the screening of the film, and then major discussion. You know, major discussion, some uh, a bit challenging, but, you know, we were open to the ideas. We were open to free speech. We were open to having that dialogue and discussion. So it was very effective, and we did reach a wide audience. Wow, a hundred plus university screenings. That's so impressive. Yes. Yes. It was exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. um, and actually on that, you know, topic of community impact, um, I'm interested in the broader, in discussing the broader community impact of this film. And impact of, can, of course, be measured in a number of ways, whether it's, you know, the number of university students that it reached, policy changes, media awareness, so talk to us about the impact this film has made on communities since it came out. So we were working at many levels. One was the community level, you know, the outreach, the students, the universities, uh, you know, the general public. At the same time, we were also working at change in policy because that's where the major change comes. And all of us, all of us were from different countries where, you know, policies can be very different. Uh, regarding uh, honor-based violence. In many countries at that time, honor-based violence or any kind of honor killing was just lumped under the larger heading of domestic violence. We realized after having made this film that it's not just domestic violence because domestic violence uh, is usually between, uh, you know, two partners or, you know, uh, one individual and another. Whereas honor killings 
are premeditated with uh, very often an entire family's involvement. They are planned, they're executed as a murder of an innocent person. And there were cases, enough case histories to prove that all the way from the United Kingdom to Canada to the United States. Now, I believe in the United States, not every state has legislation against honor-based violence. So we lobbied at that level. The film was shown in, in, at the Constitution, at the Congress. Uh, we reached out to as many uh, lawmakers, policymakers. We also screened the film to police officers. Now, this was very important because in some cases of honor-based violence, the lawmakers or the, the police officers don't know how to deal with it because it's something relatively new in the Western world and they're not sure how to deal with it. So we did training for them. Uh, we did uh, training for, for policymakers and uh, the changes started coming. I was invited to Sweden. There is a very large group of Kurdish women in Sweden who are lobbying against honor-based violence. And it turns out that Sweden has a very high percentage of honor-based violence in its immigrant communities. And they wanted me to speak at their parliament, parliament and show the film and convince them to make honor-based violence a separate heading under, under their criminal law. So we did that. And eventually it did happen. In uh, the United Kingdom, uh, they lobbied to have uh, female genital mutilation taught in schools, or at least the awareness of it created. And a law was passed that any teacher or medical professional who sees female genital mutilation having taken place and doesn't report it, it will be a criminal offense. So, you know, all these things started falling into place. So there was policy change. Uh, there was change in the mindset of the policymakers, of the leaders, and, uh, you know, especially with law enforcement. And it was, uh, and then um, at the, I was accredited to the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva for five years. I used to go there thrice a year. We had a screening at the UNHRC in Geneva, and the head of the Human Rights Council came, we gave her a copy of the film, and a lot of diplomats came. Uh, so we were working both at a grassroots level and at a level where the policy is made. And it was nonstop. It was the five most exhausting years, but the most exciting years of my life because, uh, you know, all of a sudden, other filmmakers, women started making, writing stories, making films about mm. uh, honor-based violence. It was no longer a taboo subject. You know, they mm. felt empowered to speak about it. So mm. it opened the doors for many, many opportunities. Yeah, when you said that you re you had just retired so that you can attend a lot of these screenings, <laughs> I was like, she retired? This does not sound like a retirement plan at all. No, <laughs> well, no, it isn't. <laughs> at least when I was working full time, I worked five days, I had the weekend off. Now it's 24-7 right. because activism never stops. And my right. activism was something I always did on the side, apart from my daily job to you know earn wages to pay my mortgage. And I've been very fortunate that I have a very supportive family. My husband, my sons uh, have been extremely supportive of the work that I do. So it helps, you know, when you have that kind of support. Yeah, and you know, in the making of this film, since you were simultaneously you played so many roles in it, right? Both in the making of it, yes, um, you were a narrator. You also participated in the film, and then after the film was picture locked, you also, you know, did a lot, so many educational screenings around the world, whether it's with students and um, grassroots communities or with police officers and um, in inside governments. Um, I'm just curious, what did you what did you learn? you know, as a human rights activist or discover in the process, in this process of making the film that was unexpected? I learned that as women, we must never stop speaking out against any kind of injustice or inequality, no matter what happens around us. And, uh, you know, as a Muslim woman myself, uh, someone who came originally from Pakistan, um, it has been an amazingly educational journey. 
it has been a very challenging journey. The challenges don't stop um, because everyone would like to shut me up. But to stand up and speak out the truth and then see what happens as a result. Uh, you know, when you were working on something that you're passionate about, or I would say for me, this is something I'm passionate about. I'm never afraid to speak the truth. I'm never afraid to be out there and say what I want to, because, uh, you know, first of all, when I turned 50, I stopped worrying about being popular. I just wanted to, <laughs> I just want to do what is right, because I have to sleep at night, right? It's my conscience that says, what have you done? Secondly, you know, I need to be the voice of the voiceless. You know, I come from a part of the world. You see what is happening to women in Afghanistan? What is happening to women in Iran? They are not able to speak out. So we decided with the making of Honor Diaries that we will be the voice of the voiceless. We will be the voice of those women who don't have an opportunity to speak out because I have the privilege of living in a country where I have the freedom uh, to say what I want. And so I need to use that to help those who don't have a voice. And, um, you know, uh, the journey, by the way, is ongoing. It never stops. You know, every single day there is something new to learn. But I also realize that um, this issue has not gone away. You know, it's gone under the carpet to some extent, but it is still alive today. If you look at the statistics of female genital mutilation, in the United States of America alone, it will boggle your mind. It is in the range of something like half a million girls and young women have either had female genital mutilation or are at risk of it. And do you see this being discussed on CNN? Do you see this being discussed on Fox? Do you see this being discussed openly anywhere? It's still not mainstream news because it's happening to someone else. But again, it becomes our responsibility, my responsibility. Why should I wait for someone else to speak about it? I will empower young girls. The work that I did with young women to encourage them to speak out, not be afraid, was very, very inspirational. Thank you for that. Um, and I'm also wondering, you were talking about since the film has been made, kind of the continuation of these issues. Um, and I remember something that you said was that a lot of the hostility towards you is not really because of what you say, but because of who you are as a woman and a Muslim woman. And I'm wondering that since the time of the film, do you feel that this has changed or are you still facing similar prejudices? <laughs> it will never change until the mindset of the people changes. It's still there because, you know, I'm fighting at many different levels. I mean, the honor-based violence is just one part of, of what I do. I'm fighting against uh, the radicalization of our youth. Uh, I'm fighting against the misuse of my faith for nefarious purposes, uh, you know. So these are all issues that are that, that don't sit well uh, with the Islamists who are those who are promoting political Islam or with the patriarchy. Uh, the fact that a woman can stand up and speak out is something that uh, hurts their ego. So yes, the, the pushback is there. It will always be there, but I don't lose sleep over it. I'm curious also, I wonder if you'd be comfortable talking more specifically about your relationship with your faith in the context of your activism? Um, like how, how does your activism complicate or inform your relationship with Islam and vice versa? So the work that I do, I've given it a label. I call it sacred activism. In fact, I've written a book about it. One of my books is about my journey as a sacred activist, you know, an activist who is uh, also a person of faith. I don't think that the two are separate because Islam as a faith informs me or teaches me to speak out against injustice, to speak out against inequality, to uh, speak out. And it's not the faith that has curbed women's rights, to, so to speak. It has been the patriarchy, the misogyny, uh, the political aspects of the faith. And my major push, of course, today is to separate the two, is to help Muslims mostly, and others understand that Islam and Islamism are two separate things. So it's an ongoing activism. It's an ongoing journey. And, uh, you know, I, as far as my faith is concerned, 
I believe as a person who is a believer and as a person of faith that I'm not answerable to any human being. You know, I'm answerable only to the creator. And that is a very liberating feeling. You know, when, when you don't have to worry about what people say. And people say, you know, this is, look at social media. So, you know, every time I post something, there are 150 five comments and I don't worry about it. I still have to say what I have to say. But this comes with age. You're very young, both of you. It, come, it comes with age. It comes with maturity. I wasn't always like this. I used to be concerned about what people would say. But the making the participation in honor diaries was also a journey towards the fact that we have to speak up. We have no choice. Because if we don't, others will speak for us. Right, yeah. Um, I'm wondering, are you still in contact with any of the other women that were participants in this film? Not all of them, but many of them, yes. Yes, because, you know, they're all doing great work. So every now and I would love for us to meet again the way we did when the film was being made. You know, uh, all of us are involved in our own lives. But yes, we are in touch. Uh, in fact, Ayan Hissi Ali, who was also, uh, you know, very much a part of this documentary hosted a conference a little while ago again for activists who are uh, working to make uh, you know working to make the world a better place now as far as i'm concerned if women are 50 percent or at least maybe more of the world's population if we make the world a better place for women we automatically have one half the battle and for me my activism or my so-called feminism is not anti-men uh, which reminds me that we made a great conscious effort to show this film to young men as well. We felt it was really important. And you know, they were uncomfortable in their seats, especially the young students, because some of it is very graphic. And uh, you know, there was a lot of crunching of teeth, but it was it was very beneficial. We This is not a battle that we want to fight alone. We have to educate the boys so that there is a change in their attitude towards the girls. So this is not uh, the kind of radical feminist movement where men are not, uh, you know, part of it. Very much inclusive of men. Right. Yeah. Um, I know we're kind of coming to the end here, but I'm wondering. You mentioned the word battle. Um, where do you see this battle going in the future? Like, where is that heading for you? You know, uh, it all depends on the people who will pick up. The, the, you know, the cudgels and fight for their rights. We can only do so much to create the awareness. You know, my organization, Muslims Facing Tomorrow, has this 3E mandate, which says that we must expose the problem, educate the masses, and then empower for change. I think we've managed to do a lot of the first part, you know, which is expose the problem. But to educate the masses, now you're talking, at, for me, let's say we're looking at third world countries, you're talking about masses of people who are illiterate, uh, you know, when, uh, and the poverty is such. So let's say the, the women in the villages in Pakistan who don't have three meals a day, who don't have a roof over their head, the children are dying, they are racked with disease. How do I tell them about their rights as women? So, you know, it's it's a very layered situation. We have to economically empower the women. We have to be able to talk to them. There has to be education. I could not stress that enough. And you take the example of Malala Yousafzai. Uh, you know, she's such a great role model and uh, from Pakistan. And the, the whole focus is on education. And this is not just secular education, but education about our rights, about the facts of life, who we are as women, our bodies belong to ourselves, we are empowered to speak out. It does not exist in large swaths of society. So the education is constant. You know, I'm part therapist, part mentor, part grandmother, <laughs> you know, uh, part psychologist. So. It, it is a continuous journey. Um, Rahil, I'm still hung up on that term you said earlier about sacred activism. I just love that. And now I'll be sure to um, look for the book that you wrote on sacred activism. Just the whole idea about how the strength of your faith also animates and sustains your career as an activist is just very inspiring. Um, and I can have a whole other conversation with you about I would that. love to. 
<laughs> well, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Rahil, for joining us. We it will is send entirely you... my pleasure. <laughs> we will send you a recording of this live streamed event when it's ready. And Thank just a quick note about how you can participate in American Insights 2023 Free Speech Film Festival. You, Rahil, of course, and any other filmmakers out there who um, are watching, submissions are officially open until April 30th by visiting filmfreeway.com and searching for Free Speech Film Festival. Already in the first month of submissions to this year's festival, we have received dozens of films from over 29 countries, including Iran. So please save the date, Wednesday, November 15th, for this year's Free Speech Award Ceremony, which will be held at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. We will be in touch with you so soon about our upcoming speakeasies. Thank you for joining us.